The only way you can get the dots drawn there is in the books that I've written, because there's no one else that's looking at these oils to the extent that I've been looking at them. They build up in our body fat in ways that give us type 2 diabetes eventually. Along the way, they make us gain weight, they change our appetites, they make us crave sugar. The whole idea that cholesterol is bad, again, we have to look at who's talking here. What's the source of this information? That comes from Ansel Keys and nobody else. So we can't trust him. So don't trust him. Our body fat is the biggest organ in our body and its job is to fuel our cells. And we can have so much polyunsaturated fat in it that it can't do its basic job and nobody's paying attention to this. That's the craziest part of all. What I'm saying is you're on a collision course with some sort of deadly disease as long as you have these oils in your diet and your body fat. Dr. Kate, when it comes to improving our health, you say that the number one thing we can do is avoid vegetable oils at all costs. Talk about why that is. Vegetable oils are the worst ingredient in processed food. In fact, I think they are the defining ingredient of processed food. They are ultra processed. And unlike the other common ingredients in our junk food, you know, sugar and refined flours, these things didn't exist before the industrial era. And they couldn't have existed because they're so toxic when they're initially extracted from the seeds. And it requires extensive processing. It took over 200 years of chem chemists tinkering around um, to make these oils not immediately deadly, you know, like fit for human consumption, not like, phys like physically smelly and repulsive. Um, so they're really should not be considered food actually at all. Uh, so they are the worst ingredient in the food supply and the understanding that, you know, how do they stand out from all the other terrible ingredients in processed food has to do with chemistry. So I'm going to be talking a lot about chemistry. <laughs> all right. Well, let's get to. into the nuance. I'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> I think before we do that, though, a couple things I want to point out. You use the word seed oils, and that's a synonym for vegetable oils, the way I opened up there. And number two, what are we talking about when we use that term seed oils? Let's give people the lay of the land of what, what these are. Yeah, so seed oils and vegetable oils are somewhat synonymous. Um, there's really no De definite definition. Okay. So like if you were to ask the man on the street or, or like the, the president of Harvard nutrition school, they wouldn't have, you know, the same idea, um, because there really isn't a agreed upon terminology. So just to get that out, right? Like, so I've come up with a list that I think are the worst ones that we should be paying attention to. Other people have different lists. Um, so mine, I group, there are eight of them and I call them the hateful eight, just so you can remember there's eight. And then, um, the, the worst ones are, are six, the first six. And there's three that start with the letter C corn, canola, and cotton seed. And three that start with the letter S soy, sunflower, and safflower. And those are the most important to remember. So if you only have the brain space for six, think of it as the sinister six instead of the hateful eight. And those are the most important to remember because you're going to find them written on the ingredients list of the processed foods that you buy. Unless you're in the UK, in which case you won't see the C for canola, you'll, it'll be R. So <laughs> I just learned that after I came up with the three C, three F, S mnemonic. So to come up with something else for UK. R for rapeseed. Um, if you're in the UK or Australia, I think, Canada. Um, so the other two, what are those? Um, rice bran and grapeseed. And those ones are mostly now in like fine dining restaurants. So they're not as prevalent as the other two, but they're all just about equally bad. They're all horrible. And I picked them out, uh, you know, as opposed to like peanut oil and why not why not um, olive oil? That's also a vegetable oil. So I picked them out due to their chemistry. And so this is where if, um, if you want to know why they're bad, we can start talking about the chemistry. Yeah, let's get into it. Say somebody has some processed food, it has a couple of these different oils in it. What happens in the body? 
So the chemicals in these oils are different from traditional fats people used to eat. And why does that matter? Well, for two reasons. One is these chemicals, um, I'm talking about here, the fatty acids called polyunsaturated fatty acids. And you, you don't need to remember the name. You just need to remember that seed oils have a different fat chemical composition and that difference makes them much more unstable and uh, they tend to turn into toxins after reacting with oxygen. When they will do that, they will react with oxygen when you heat them or if they're exposed to a lot of light or just sort of uh, the, the air on top of the bottle um, if they sit around in your cupboard for a long time, they're that unstable. You should not expose them to heat or light. Yet we cook with them. This is insane. <laughs> and chemists have been trying to tell the public that these oils are not great for cooking. Well, actually, that's not entirely too true. Chemists have been trying to tell the health authorities who tell the public what to eat that these oils are chemically unstable and it's very hard to make them safe for use in a restaurant deep fryer setting, for example, or really cooking. Like, you know, processed food companies, they cook, right? So if you're getting like a Hot Pocket or, uh, you know, a bean burrito or something, uh, or soup even, and it has these vegetable oils, they've been heated, they've been cooked. And the chemists who are responsible for making these oils as safe as possible have told me when I've interviewed them, they would love it if we could go back to just using tallow and saturated fat-rich foods the way we did before the American Heart Association intervened in our dietary guidelines in the 1950s. Um, and so as far as they're concerned, uh, it, their lives would be easier. They would be able to make restaurant fruit food and processed food more healthy or at least less toxic um, if the American Heart Association weren't standing in the way saying that, no, no, these unstable polyunsaturate chemicals are actually fine and the stable saturated fats that humanity has been eating for thousands of years, like forever, those are the ones that have suddenly started making us fat, get heart attacks, develop cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, you name it. So like there's this huge disconnect between the chemistry and the common sense reality and what the American Heart Association teaches doctors. It's not just doctors, they teach dietitians this too. So we often hear that like doctors just aren't learning enough about nutrition and that's why they don't know about seed oils. No, dietitians who specialize in this are also learning the same misinformation that comes from the American Heart Association. They are the source of this idea that these oils are a healthy alternative to what people used to eat. If you're enjoying this episode, let me know by clicking like and subscribe below. Thank you so much. And now back to the show. All right, well, let's take the story even further. We have these unstable seed oils getting into the body through processed foods and other. Yeah. Let's talk about what happens next. So what happens next is they build up in our body fat in ways that give us type 2 diabetes eventually. And along the way, they make us gain weight, they change our appetites, they make us crave sugar. So it becomes very difficult to control our weight. And that's why we gain weight. Um, so... That is, that, what I just said, is my, like, original hypothesis about how we get from seed oils, processed foods, but specifically the seed oils, and to our epidemic of obesity and chronic disease. And you're not going to find that anywhere else. And I'm, I'm just saying this because it's not like you can go look that up and like uh, say, oh yeah, is that valid? No. The only way you can get the, the dots drawn there is uh, in the books that I've written because there's no one else that's looking at uh, these oils to the extent that I've been looking at them, which, you know, 
that began 20 plus years ago. So this has been a uh, journey for me to like really dive deep into understand what's going on here in the world with our health, thanks to the fact that these oils that we shouldn't be eating are now the main fats in most people's diets and how they change our, our body fat. Does that make sense, changing the body fat? Because probably... Yeah. Well, let's talk more about that. How do they get incorporated? And then once they're in there, what do we do to get them out? So again, we have to talk chemistry, right? Like I have to apologize for that because a lot of people are not familiar with these words, saturated and polyunsaturated, but that's where all the action is in terms of understanding uh, human health because our bodies are made of chemicals, right? Like when you crave something, that's dopamine and serotonin. What are those? Chemicals, right? When Ava, like when you like see an attractive person and you're like, physically, you know, responding to that, like, wow, I would like to go meet that person or whatever. It, when, it, when you fall in love, that is chemistry, right? So chemistry really is relevant. It's very relevant. It's not like some esoteric thing that has nothing to do with real life. It is what creates real life. So, uh, so that's why I, like, I've just, um, really gone back to the beginning of how did life on earth get started actually even to to understand chemistry and believe it or not it has to do with something that happened three billion years ago when mitochondria first evolved the things that create uh the energy for our cells when the earth's planet went from having zero oxygen to a whole bunch of oxygen and oxygen started killing all life on earth and uh eventually uh the way, actually, the way that oxygen was killing life on Earth three billion years ago was by oxidizing the polyunsaturated fatty acids in the cell membranes of every living thing. There were no antioxidants at that time. So to survive biology, life had to invent antioxidants. Isn't that cool? <laughs> that is, yeah. Tell me more about that. So... So I promise I will get to how this makes us fat. <laughs> but um, so what the next thing that happens, so antioxidants control the reactions between oxygen and polyunsaturates. And one of the like byproducts of, of these reactions is some energy gets released, right? Some heat. And nobody really knows how this happened, but about two and a half billion years ago, or maybe 2 billion years ago, they don't know, uh, <laughs> the uh, organelle called a mitochondria learned how to harness that energy of those reactions with oxygen using the antioxidants that it, it had developed or some other organism has developed and it sort of stole and generate energy called ATP. So that leap forward in life was driven by the chemical reaction between oxygen being invented by the earliest plants on earth that were single celled plants that created all this oxygen. Then they created this huge problem because oxygen, nothing didn't exist and it's highly reactive and dangerous. So they, that's why everything almost died. They had to create antioxidants. And then a very smart little organelle called the mitochondria said, Hey, gee, um, I'm going to take all this energy and heat of reactions that's just being wasted and harness it and it was such a popular idea that every type of cell alive today has mitochondria, that if it's an organism that has more than one um, cell, like all multi-celled organisms have mitochondria. They, they, what they did, they stole the mitochondrial's um, intellectual property. They literally like engulfed it, or you could almost say they ate it, but they didn't kill it and digest it. They just let it sit there doing its thing. And um, somehow or other, <laughs> they developed a perfect relationship that still continues today. So the mitochondria um, are the solution to oxygen destroying polyunsaturated fatty acids. So that, that right there tells you there's something about mitochondria and polyunsaturated fatty acids that we should be paying attention to, but nobody is. And that's when I discovered what it was that we should be paying attention to, I had to write a whole book about it because it had so much uh, consequence. All right, we'll keep going here. 
okay. <laughs> that book was called The Fat Burn Fix. And that book draws the connections. Um, so I, I just felt it was so important. I had to write it down, right? Like I had to make people really understand that these seed oils were important to avoid or else we were going to all get sick in one way or the, or the other and um, ultimately, you know, diabetes. So, so what happens is, um, you know, we're born and our, our bodies can use body fat for fuel. And let's just dial it back to the 1970s when we didn't have an insane amount of seed oils in our food supply. We, we had higher than, you know, ever, but uh, today's amount of seed oils in the food supply, I mentioned earlier, 80% of most people's fat calories. Um, and uh, it, I suppose in terms of just to a hundred years ago or 150 years ago, they just didn't exist in the food supply. So that means we're eating a lot more polyunsaturated fatty acids than ever. And we have to kind of talk about like, what is the normal amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids in human body fat? Because that's what this all boils down to. These oils, even when, you know, I talked about how they deteriorate into toxins, even if you just have them and they haven't deteriorated, but you have too many of them in your diet, which we do, they will build up in your body fat and that changes the composition of your body fat. So instead of having between one and 5% of these unstable polyunsaturates, uh, you have somewhere between probably 10 and 40%, you know, depending on what you eat and other factors. So that is somewhere between two times and 40 times the amount of these unstable fats that our bodies are designed to handle, right? So that's a big deal. Our bodies are just simply not designed to handle this stuff. And the mitochondria are kind of like little engines in our cells generating energy. They literally have things that look like turbines that spin around and spit out ATP. Um, well, if you were to, you know, take your car and try it, you know, cars are supposed to run on gasoline Gasoline has a certain chemical composition. Um, cars not supposed to run on, you know, say like uh, olive oil, right? Um, you know, people can make lamps out of olive oil. Or they used to. It, it will burn, but the cars are just not tooled to run on olive oil. You can't dump it into your car and expect it to go anywhere. So, um, you know, you have to have a certain kind of an engine. Well, that's just the same exact thing with mitochondria. We can't just use too much polyunsaturated fatty acid. W the amount that we uh, traditionally have in our bodies is, like I said, somewhere between 1% and 5%. It was so small that really mitochondria never had to burn that. Mitochondria are really designed to burn um, the other types of fat that are actually in animal you know, animal fat, we're animals, um, that are normally in animal fat. And those other types are the monounsaturated fats that you hear about often in olive oil, but actually they're also in, um, you know, pork and chicken, um, and the saturated fats that you hear often about is in animal fat, but also they're in smaller quantities and everything else you eat. But the monounsaturates and the saturates are extremely chemically stable. So that when they, um, get around oxygen in the mitochondria, things don't get out of control. And it's all about control. Life is all about controlling reactions. And when your body starts to, um, you know, become unable to control reactions, that's death, right? That, that if it happens in one cell, the cell will die. If it happens in many tissues, the tissue will die or you will die. So we have to control reactions. And when we fill our body fat up with all these unstable fatty acids that when they get around oxygen inside our mitochondria, things get out of control. Well, the mitochondria can't produce energy anymore the way that they're supposed to. It's as simple as that. And if our mitochondria can't produce energy while we're supposed to be burning our body fat, um, well, the cell's going to die if it doesn't think of something else to do. So what does it do? it uses other fuels, right? Mitochondria can burn protein, they can burn sugar, they can burn alcohol, they can burn um, other small molecules like you know lactate and stuff. Um, and of course they can burn the different types of fats. But the one thing that is always in our blood supply is sugar. So our little cells get start to get better and better at slurping out higher than normal amounts of sugar from our bloodstream. 
Uh, okay. So this makes it sound like we should be eating sugar in this state, doesn't it? A little bit? Well, it sounds like an alternative, not necessarily a good one. All right. Now, imagine, you know, we have something like uh, almost a, maybe a trillion cells in our body. Imagine if they all start slurping just a little bit of sugar out of our blood supply, out of our bloodstream. What's going to happen to our blood sugar level in that scenario? What do you think it's will happen? going to plummet quickly. It is. And how do we feel when our blood sugar starts to plummet quickly? Do we feel good and no. energized? Hypoglycemia sets in. Exactly. Low blood sugar. That's what hypoglycemia means. And hypoglycemia causes extreme hunger. And do we feel good? Do we feel energized? No. We we can feel anxious, shaky. Um, if it's affecting our brain, we can get brain fog, concentration problems. And research has shown that when we are hangry and our blood sugar is dropping, we become irritable, angry more often. We are ineffective at work. We can't like do this important thing called... Um, our brain can't do this important thing called executive thinking, executive functions. It can't strategize. Um, basically, it, it you know you can think of it as just like you become dumb because <laughs> your brain is not working, right? It's it's a uh, temporary. And what do you do? What what do you crave when you're hypoglycemic and ha hangry? Do you More crave, sugar. Yeah. Do you crave salad or carrots? No. You go straight for the donuts or the cookies or pretzels or food that you know is going to make you feel good. And it's going to make you feel better because it raises your blood sugar. And this is very confusing to people. It's confusing to doctors. It's confused sports dietitians because sports dietitians now think that athletes need sugar to perform right? It's confused the entire world. And people are, are at, the, at the same time, we're hearing how, well, sugar's causing diabetes. No, actually. Sugar's not causing diabetes. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying these polyunsaturated fatty acids from the vegetable oils are the root cause of insulin resistance that drives diabetes. And I connect the dots a little bit for you in, um, in the fat burn fix, but it has to do like, cause I've just said it makes our blood sugar drop and then we crave sugar, right? But the other thing that happens when our blood sugar drops is that our stress hormones go crazy. That's why we get shaky and angry, right? We're irritable. Our, some people get sweaty and their heart starts to race. It's a stress response. Your body's releasing adrenaline and um, epinephrine and cortisol. And what does that do? Well, it raises our blood sugar. It makes the liver release stored glycogen, and it makes our um, liver also start doing something called gluconeogenesis, which raises our, our fasting blood sugar. So now we're getting to insulin resistance because if the liver is raising our fasting blood sugar and the pancreas says, wait a second, blood sugar's too high. I'm going to release insulin. The liver's getting opposite messages. It's getting this message from the stress hormones, alert, alert. We got to raise blood sugar, but it's getting this message from the pancreas, insulin, insulin, the blood sugar's too high. So the liver becomes insulin resistant. That is why vegetable oils are the root cause of insulin resistance, which is almost universal now in America. I looked at a study, 99% uh, plus of people are insulin resistant. Insulin resistance is the beginning of type 2 diabetes, the very early stage. If, they, if you don't change things, you're very likely to become pre-diabetic or type 2 diabetic. And when insulin resistance begins, you explain how the liver is getting the two messages and it gets confused. Does it begin within that organ specifically or throughout the whole body? Well, um, it starts, yeah, it starts in the liver, at least, uh, you know, what we've found in most people is it looks like for the average person, it starts in the liver. It is possible that other organs could become insulin resistant first, but what it looks like is that it's the liver. And, and to me, that makes the most sense because the um, signals are, are d direct, in, you know, the signal to raise sugar 
um, uh, the organ that's in charge of raising sugar is the liver, I should say, right? So it's not any other organ in the body that can raise our blood sugar. Um, it, it's just the liver. So that's, to me, it makes logical sense that the, the liver um, is the, the organ of conflict here when somebody's developing insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Okay. Let me try and go through this really high level to see if I have it and and you can confirm whether or not I do. We feed our mitochondria sugar. Actually, no, take that back even further. We feed them vegetable oils, which doesn't work. They take sugar instead. And this isn't a great source of fuel because it'll have us within a couple hours wanting more sugar. So basically, we're going to have at that point our body telling us to eat more, plus the hypothalamus is going to get involved and tell the liver to release more sugar. The pancreas is going to start releasing insulin, telling the cells to take up the sugar. So the liver is going to become confused. And this is the beginning of insulin resistance. Yeah, because the liver can't listen to the, the pancreas and the stress hormones at the same, it can't do both, right? So the liver really has no choice. The stress hormones, biology just has created the world where the stress hormones take precedent, right? Because they're normally the flight or fight, our life's in danger. So we have to be able to listen to those stress hormones and that's just the way we're wired. So uh, the liver starts to ignore insulin and then things really go off the rails here because then the pancreas starts producing more insulin all the time. And that drives our blood sugar down overnight. We start waking up overnight and then our, our bodies uh, are, uh, the thing that produces cortisol, the adrenal gland, um, start going into a little bit of overdrive, right? You've heard this thing called adrenal stress. I used to think it was kind of a foo-foo thing. I think this is what it is, is, is that, um, you know, the adrenal glands are always being stimulated to produce cortisol. Um, and, and that the, the body's just always going through this stress reaction that this has actually been validated, you know, since the book came out, I keep seeing more evidence that this is actually what is going on in our bodies to drive uh, insulin resistance. For example, um, there was a doctor who uh, gave a presentation at an obesity specialist who was an endocrine doctor specializing in diabetes, who does fancy tests on his patients where he hooks them up to um, gas analyzer. They breathe uh, into this machine that analyzes their expired oxygen and CO2, and they can measure whether or not they're burning their body fat or burning sugar. And he stunned an audience that he was giving this lecture to by saying, many of our diabetics never burn their body fat. Like that maybe while they're holding still at rest, like, you know, doing literally nothing, they might burn a little bit, but you get them, get their heart rate up just a little bit, poof, they're just burning sugar. So they spend most of their lives trying to lose weight when their body doesn't want them to burn body fat and, you know, burning sugar instead. And now here's where we have to think about how does the liver make sugar from scratch like that? Because <laughs> it, it can't just do it easily, right? It can't just make sugar from other things that you ate. It can't make sugar, for example, from your body fat. It would be wonderful if it could um, in this scenario, but it can't. So the only way that the liver can make sugar uh, is by breaking down protein from our lean tissue, so like our muscle more evidence in the form of the fact that people are skinny fat. Type 2 diabetics are skinny fat. What is skinny fat? You are normal body weight, but your percent of body fat is out of proportion high because your lean mass is depleted or down. Very, you know, and why does that happen? Because they're always in the state of stress where their stress hormones are saying to the liver, we got to produce blood sugar. And the stress hormones can also make the muscle start to break down. That's what, you know, cortisol does. That's why we don't want to get people in a state of stress all the time because it will 
emotional stress can do this too. It can make your, the cortisol can make your body start breaking down its own muscle to energize cells, right? To, to energize that fight or flight response, to get that blood sugar up. So it's really a tragic state of affairs that we are stuck in here because there's all these seed oils in the food supply now. They're very hard to avoid. And everybody is told to focus more on calories or sugar or just get that weight off and then you'll be healthy. That's backwards. We have to get healthy first. We have to be able to make our uh, body fat safe for our mitochondria to burn before we can really lose weight and keep it off. Right. You can, if you're like 300 pounds and you, you know, stop snacking, right. You're going to lose weight because you're just not building so much fat. Um, but, but it, it, in order to really, you know, if you're only 20, 40 pounds overweight or something, sometimes I tell people, you know, let's focus on something else other than your weight first. You know, I know you want to lose weight and we'll get you there, but I have to reframe the entire conversation because weight isn't the the primary cause of metabolic disease, the way it c- currently our most obesity experts are talking about it that way, which is crazy. Weight doesn't make us unhealthy. Healthy body fat isn't necessarily all that unhealthy. I mean, it's not great to have extra weight that you're hauling around, but if your body fat composition is normal, that's not going to be super bad. You can still burn it and you can lose weight. But when your body fat composition is not normal and you try to just cut your calories or cut your carbohydrates so that you can lose weight, you're actually possibly making your whole health situation worse. And I suspected this might be the case just because I heard so many reports of my patients who were like, well, I went on this diet and I lost all this weight, but then I was developed, I developed prediabetes or I started getting kidney stones or I I had gout. It was terrible. Um, uh, Some people got really sick, like, uh, you know, people who did extreme 30 day fasts and lost a lot of weight. Um, a couple folks developed severe autoimmune disorders. One person developed multiple sclerosis. I mean, it, it's just, I was, this was before I developed the whole fat burn fix book theory. Um, but it was something that started getting my wheels turning about what's going on here. Like, this is not, this is not right. Something strange happening. And the strange thing is that our body fat composition is radically altered so that our body fat can't fuel our cells. That's like crazy. Our body fat is the biggest organ in our body and its job is to fuel our cells. And we can have so much polyunsaturated fat in it that it can't do its basic job and nobody's paying attention to this. That's the craziest part of all. A big part of the problem that I want to get into is the fact that if somebody's been unaware of what we're talking about today and having a lot of the omega-6 over a period of time, it does build up in the tissues. And it's not like you can cut it out of the diet and within a week or two, you're clear of it. So talk about that process of first realizing what we're talking about today. Second step, eliminating them from bringing more into the body. How long do they stay in the body? What we've accumulated And is there a way to speed up the process of getting them out? Right. You absolutely have to get these polyunsaturates out before you can be healthy again. And um, I want to talk about that. But before we dive into that, you said something that um, people might have heard before called um, the omega-6, right? The omega-6 issue. These oils are high in omega-6, but that's not the problem. Because if they were high in omega-3, that's another polyunsaturated fatty acid, we would be even less healthy. Because omega-3 is even more unstable than omega-6. There's more double bonds in there. It's just, it's the chemistry of it. You know, so it's kind of fortunate that soy and corn and cottonseed are relatively higher in omega-6 than omega-3 because if it were the other way around, we'd be worse off. We would have somewhat different problems. Maybe we wouldn't have blood clotting. We We would be bleeding to death for example, because so these um, omegas have different effects in our body, but those effects are minor 
compared to the the root cause of the problem, which is the oxidation and the free radical cascades and just the out of control chaos that happens, right? So going back 3 billion years ago, um, it wasn't that there was an imbalance in omega-6 and omega-3. It was that it was just too much polyunsaturate and too much oxygen at the same time. And these reactions were just out of control and killing every cell. So does that make sense? Because that is something yeah, I, I wanted- hear a lot. Jump in real quick and break that down, though. What you're yeah. saying is you have the PUFAs <laughs> at the top. That branches to the omega-3s and omega-6s. I know linoleic acid under the omega-6s is another piece of what we're talking about here. Clarify the omega-3 part, though. So the most Because we're, we're told that, again, you talked about the balance between omega-3 and omega-6 and how omega-3s are traditionally in, in the health and wellness space looked at as good, and we want to up those. Break down the, where the trouble sets in. Well, okay. So let's first, let's talk about, we have to talk about chemistry. I mean, it comes down to chemistry. We can't answer any of this without chemistry, but I'll, the, it's a really simple concept. Um, it's just how many double bonds is in there. So when we talk about polyunsaturate, poly means, you know, many or two <laughs> or more than two. Unsaturate means there's a double bond in the, in the molecule. And, you know, it doesn't matter what a double bond is just matters that it's less stable and easily breakable reacts with oxygen. So the more of these double bonds, the more quickly it's going to react with oxygen. And it turns out if you have zero double bonds, like saturated fat, you do not react with oxygen basically at all, except for, you know, uh, with enzymes and that's what mitochondria do, but not like spontaneously, right? You can't like ignite, um, (laughs) you can't like ignite uh, tallow quite as easily as you can ignite some of these other things. Um, but, uh, so it has to do with the stability and the stability comes from double bonds or the lack of double bonds. So monounsaturated has one double bond, right? So that's olive oil is much more stable, not as stable as saturated fat, um, but more stable than the omega, the omega-6 linoleic acid, which has two double bonds. Okay, so the uh, omega-3 equivalent is called linolenic acid, which sounds very similar, so it's already getting confusing, Um, but it has three double bonds, so that makes it more reactive. How how much more reactive? Is it just like two-thirds more reactive? No, it's at least 10 times more reactive, and in some settings, it could be 100 or 1,000 times more reactive, so it's way worse in terms of... um, just the chemical nature of it and this out of control reaction stuff that is the root cause of our metabolic diseases. So, um, so to understand it in terms of the omega-6 versus the omega-3, that's a whole separate conversation that has almost nothing to do with the out of control reaction and double bond discussion. That has to do with enzymes and uh, so omega-6 linoleic acid is a precursor to another um, fatty acid in our body called arachidonic acid. And that arachidonic acid can be is a precursor to something that promotes inflammation when we have an infection or an injury, not just for nothing. <laughs> so, uh, and that's important because it's it's regulated and it's not out of control, right? And so... So omega-6 is not just an an unhealthy thing. And omega-3 is not just a healthy thing. Uh, The omega-3 fatty acids, in turn, is the same scenario. If we want to have that, like you said, at the top, there's a pyramid, and then we have like the omega-6 linoleic, omega-3 linoleic. Well, what happens next in the cascade is the body elongates each of those into these precursors. And then the the enzymes turn the precursors into a um, a signaling molecule that either makes blood vessels more, um, you know, dilate or makes blood vessels constrict. They have have opposite effects and we kind of label one inflammatory and one anti-inflammatory. But it gets all theoretical and philosophical and messy because biology isn't really black and white like that. And the idea simply doesn't hold up to scrutiny. It's actually been um, debunked by the person who came up with it in the first place. Her, her name is Artemis Simopoulos. She 
thought it was worth investigating and she investigated it. And she said, yes, it's a problem in some small cir- circumstances and people who have you know, genetic predispositions, but generally it's not largely responsible for inf- our inflammatory diseases. She couldn't pin it on that. So that idea needs to die. <laughs> Um, and we need to get back to just the more fundamental understanding of basic chemistry, you know, and, and paying attention to controllable reactions and re- reactions that our bodies cannot control. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Before we move forward, though, I want to make sure I understand the omega-3 piece from a practical sense, given what you said about it. Should we be consuming omega-3s like we're quote unquote told to do through diet and supplements? Or given what you're saying here, how do we navigate that? Yeah, so, um, you know, and the the big picture is that we don't need supplements to get omega-3. As long as we eat food, we're getting enough omega-3. It's like I said, we don't really need that much polyunsaturates. Remember in the beginning, I was talking about, you know, maybe 1% or 5% of our diet is combined, the combined, you know, omega-3 and omega-6, right? So, um, so we just don't need that much that we need to supplement. As long as we can eat some nuts and some seeds and, uh, you know, if things like fish, um, we're going to be getting plenty. They're in the food supply. We can't, we can't totally eradicate those either. Um, but, and there, there may be some exceptions where people might benefit from supplementing, not with the short chain, but with the long chain. Um, and that's a whole other, that's a whole other conversation. It's really a, you know, a a severe consequence of having this high vegetable oil diet is that our bodies can no longer do that precursor of the precursor elongation thing where you take the the short chain omega-6 and make it a longer chain omega-6. At at some point when we have so much seed oil in our body fat and our liver just doesn't work very well, it can't make that important conversion. So we can't turn... The, the, the kinds of omega-3s that are in plants into the kinds of omega-3s that our brain needs and our nervous system needs and some other cells in our body need, the longer chain ones that are, that are in fish oil. So some people might need to eat fish. I wouldn't recommend fish oil because it's so unstable. Studies always show that unless it's like basically just been made on the dock where they caught the fish, um, it's going to break down into toxic stuff and you're going to be getting a lot of toxic stuff along with some of the fatty acids that you need, right? So it's just really much better to get it from food. All right. I'm glad we went into that and sifted that out. We were on a tangent. I want to take us back to seed oils getting incorporated into the body and getting those out. Yeah. So somebody right now that's worried about that because they haven't been aware of what we're talking about How long are they in the body and what can we do to get them out quicker or can we? Well, they're in our body fat, right? So they're body fat. They are body fat. And if you, um, you know, you want to lose weight, you're going to be getting rid of some of them. (laughs) You're going to be burning them. Uh, That's basically the only way we can get rid of them is to burn them for fuel or build them into our own cell membranes. Um, And so the answer is it takes a long time. Just like losing weight takes a long time, right? If you have, you know, 10 pounds to lose or 100 pounds to lose, it's going to take longer to lose the 100 pounds than the 10 pounds. So the more that you have in your body, and you do have more if you just have more body fat, the longer it's going to take. But, I mean, that's like, that's sort of like a good news and bad news scenario because the, there's good news here. The good news is that the first day that you stop eating these things and start eating really healthy fats and do the other things that I um, recommend in my in my books, which you'll probably want to go over. So keep listening. <laughs> right. um, it, you know, the more that you do those, if you start on day one, you're, you uh, potentially will start feeling better, you know, immediately on day one, depending on what your diet was like um, and how much of a change this is. You know, I recommend eating foods that will energize your cells. And I tell you how to do that in the fat burn fix. And when you start doing that, you start feeling better immediately. (laughs) And then, so that's good news. Um, 
the bad news is that, yeah, it does take a while for all of those unsaturates to get out of your body fat. Studies really haven't been done on this. We're just extrapolating from some other studies in normal weight people before these seed oils were in the food supply to the extent that they are. So we're guessing four years, six years, but we don't, nobody knows, nobody knows. It could be faster or it could be slower. But, um, what I found is that, uh, people, uh, still lose weight, right? As long as they aren't eating the excess of calories that they were eating. And it just, it's slow, right? Like the reality is fast weight loss is a unhealthy idea. And I think that's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. And even the medical system just doesn't want to swallow that pill because most weight loss doctors believe that you have to give people rapid weight loss to keep them motivated. My strategy is you have to tell people the truth about what really made them sick in the first place so they understand. And then, you know, they may, (laughs) that should motivate them because what I'm saying is you're on a collision course with some sort of deadly disease as long as you have these oils in your diet and your body fat. So... Let's come back to the liver being confused and getting the different signals. And this being, you have a great little diagram in the book showing hypoglycemia to insulin resistance to prediabetes to diabetes. Take us through how the progression happens and over what period of time. Yeah, so I think it happens over decades. And so the progression starts with... uh, really with feeling those low blood sugar episodes. We were talking about earlier, the hypoglycemia, because you're feeling that because your body needs more sugar than is in the blood supply, right? We're supposed to be able to burn our body fat. Hypoglycemia is the first warning sign and it stays with us until we resolve it. Um, You know, it stays with us all the way till we through becoming pre-diabetic and it stays with us to becoming type two diabetic. Um, and that is a progression. So we start out with hypoglycemia, which is insulin resistance. Those are really the same. Um, and then insulin resistance, as it gets worse and worse, and our, our um, pancreas pumps more insulin, so we have more in our body when we're fasting. The, a normal fasting insulin level would be something like maybe one or two. And most people nowadays, uh, even when we can... This, those who are considered healthy and normal weight because of the seed oils, the fasting insulin level is at best five, but the average insulin level is something like 12 and that is too high. So those, those folks are already insulin resistant. That's why your insulin is high because your body's not responding to a normal amount at all. And, you know, there's this battle going on and it just takes, it's like a, it's like a, what is that? Warfare, chemical warfare, or it's just like escalation. That's the word I'm looking for. It's like an escalation of warfare, right? It's like in the Cold War. Russia had so many missiles. We needed to have so many missiles, right? That's what's happening. The liver is producing more sugar. The pancreas is producing more insulin. And we just arbitrarily, doctors call, arbitrarily call these things insulin resistance, pre-diabetes and diabetes based on how high the blood sugar is. But under, under the, underneath that raising blood sugar, what they're not measuring is the raising insulin level. That doesn't get measured very often. But if we did measure that, we would be able to capture um, before people develop diabetes in, while they're still in that insulin resistant phase. But you don't really need to measure if you just are, if you know what to look for in terms of hypoglycemia. And so I have a chart um, that has 11 of the common hypoglycemia symptoms, which include things like shaking, brain fog, jitteriness, um, nausea even. And I have a little sheet you can print out that says, how often are you having these symptoms? So you can track it. And that's really the best, best way to detect the development of insulin resistance and to follow to resolution. If you can go, you know, 12 hours without feeling any of these hypoglycemia symptoms um, at all, and you just don't ever get hangry or any of those bad things, that indicates you're burning your body fat. 
How long can we burn our body fat before we start to get hypoglycemic? Well, when we're healthy, several days. So, um, so there you are. <laughs> and I can see where for people getting caught in this trap we're talking about can be so self-reinforcing because if they start getting hangry after a couple hours finishing, say, lunch, and it's not quite dinner yet, they have a snack, they're going to feel better. The hangriness is going to go away. And then you're going to continue to have more carbs or sugar likely and continue this cycle. And then the dietitian is going to tell you you're doing the right thing by having snacks throughout the day or your doctor. So everything is so self-reinforcing. I can see how people get caught in this. Yeah. And it's, it, it's reinforced this wrong paradigm too, that, um, you know, that we're in, that, that we need to lose. That's all backwards. It doesn't give us good results. And, you know, the worst time of day, um, to, to, there was a study that showed that people are the most irritable and the most hangry when they come home from work. And, uh, there was a fascinating study that a psychologist did that tested people's blood sugar levels and their anger with their spouse. And they found an absolute direct correlation between how fast their blood sugar had dropped. Like not, not necessarily the, the lowness of it, but how quickly it was dropping. And their anger at their spouse and their willingness to poke pins into a voodoo doll representing their spouse. And it was you know, off the charts and people whose blood sugar dropped quickly. And when there, when that wasn't happening, people were in a better mood. So it reinforces your relationships with your loved ones too, right? Like it all gets messed up in our heads with our emotions. We develop these relationships with these foods because they help us in our relationships with people. They help us on the job. We are sugar dependent. Sugar has become a crutch for our failing metabolism. We are a sugar dependent nation and we can't just tell people stop eating sugar, right? It's not, it's not possible. We have to give our sugar dependent cells what I call slow digesting carbohydrates that sort of drip slowly into our bloodstream without spiking the insulin and triggering that fatigue later on. So, um, so that's part of the solution and part of the thing that, that is the practical end of this, right? It means, of course, you want to cut out the seed oils. And, you know, now that the keto diet's becoming more popular, people are coming to understand that, you know, healthy fats really are animal fats. But if you have, um, if you relate to the low carb flu, or if you tried keto and it didn't work for you, that's probably a reflection of the fact that, your body still needs carbs until you're not insulin resistant. And you would do well to, yes, get rid of the sodas, get rid of the, you know, the fluffy refined flour breads and muffins and those sort of junk foods. But you still probably need 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrate coming in. And those can come in from whole foods, like, uh, you know, some root vegetables, but you have to be careful with potatoes, um, beans. They can certainly come from nuts. Um, but not super high poof of seeds. You don't want to have a lot of those like chia seed. I wasn't such a big fan. I'm not such a huge fan of that anymore because chia seeds are very high in poofa. Um, but, uh, anyway, so yeah, the difference between the diet that I recommend and keto is not huge, but it's just more permissive, you know, 50 to hundred grams of carb. No one would consider that keto, but it really can help if you break that up into meals throughout the day, some carb at breakfast, some carb at lunch, some carb at dinner, in addition to these healthy, easily burned fats from your diet, that you start to rehabilitate your mitochondria. And that's what we need to think about, right? Forget about the number on the scale. We have to re we have some desperately sick little mitochondria in every single one of our cells, and they need your help now. And they need you to stop eating seed oils and to start eating healthy fats. Give them a little bit of health, you know, slow digesting carbohydrates, and give them a boatload of nutrition. They need vitamins. They need minerals. They need enough protein, but not too much protein. Not refined protein powder. I don't like protein powders. Um, so. Uh, so that's the solution. You start to, 
I want people to like visualize these little mitochondria and their cells trying so hard to do their job, but just getting delivered the wrong fuel and just starting to break down. And you, uh, you, then you visualize how you are reviving them by changing your diet instead of paying attention to the number on the scale. That, that's important. I do want people to reach their you know, body composition goals, but you're not going to get there until you heal those mitochondria. And the weight loss will be a sign that you're doing the other things right, which to get into the physiology a little bit further with insulin resistance, that continuum we talked about, basically as you go down that continuum, you're accumulating more and more insulin in the body, which is going to do two things. It's going to store a lot of fat and it's a molecule for storage. It's an anabolic. So it's going to be it's going to not allow you to burn the body fat you have on you. It keeps it kind of trapped, yeah, in the exactly. fat a little bit more. But you know, one of the things about insulin resistance when people are type 2 diabetic is that their fat cells eventually become insulin resistant. And so they don't actually even absorb fat, so it stays in your bloodstream longer. That's a problem because it causes atherosclerosis. But on the other side of it... it you, there is the free fatty acids are there. And so your body will start to utilize those. So there's, um, it's okay. It's not like you have to worry about the insulin and getting down and, you know, not having the carbs because of that, that, that will all come out in the wash. Eventually you don't have to do anything special or different to, you know, if you're type just severe type two diabetic on a lot of insulin versus not the same, the same kind of diet program is going to help you. Okay, you talked about quickly there the fact that your thoughts on chia have changed due to the PUFAs, yeah. which got me thinking about all these different oils, the Hateful Eight. From your book, you talk about how when they're in whole food form, we can still consume those. I just wanted to clarify that for people. Yeah, so in the fat burn fix, I, you know, like I evolve too, right? Like sometimes I, I, I'm not sure if I should say this or that. And I just say, well, I think this is the best advice based on what I know at the time. So in my book, I have a few like chia pudding type recipes. And that was because I was figuring, yes, well, when it's in the seed, it has all these antioxidants, it has vitamin E, it has um, some minerals and, you know, protein. Um, but now that like I've had a few more years to think about, I, I think probably we do have to, we shouldn't have them every day, right? Like I, I wouldn't say have a chia pudding every day. You can have it once in a while. It's still going to be, you know, way better than having some kind of a restaurant food cooked in seed oils for breakfast or donuts or something like that. But, um, but you know, we have to have it a little more in moderation. And the same idea with like sesame oil, which is one of my good oils and I use it too, but I, I wouldn't do it. Uh, I wouldn't use it for extended high heat cooking. You know, I just do really quick kind of pan frying for the flavor. And I don't even do that every day, you know, because it's a lot of poofa in there and I'm getting enough. And, uh, you know, I don't really need it. So, but certainly, you know, you wouldn't want to do sesame oil every day. Uh, so it, it's really just for flavor. You want to add it and not cook with it high heat. So those are some two, two little minor tweaks that I would say since I finished the, the book for five years ago now. <laughs> okay. So for somebody who coming back to the practical has been with us to this point and they, they want more on the diet and the nuances there, we've talked about seed oils. So we want to cut those right out. And a big culprit there is processed foods. What other areas should we, we be aware of when it comes to these seed oils? How are they finding their way into our bodies? Ah, right. Um, when you go out to eat, you're eating seed oils. And uh, so how often is like too often to go out to eat? Well, you know, if you're having anything deep fried, uh, that's too often. <laughs> that's basically uh, signing up you know, for a boatload of toxins. Um, so we've got to avoid the deep fried. If you have to go out to eat, you know, for work or something like that. Um, uh, but you know, folks who aren't paying attention to the seed oils, if they're, even if they're just eating out two or three times a week, you're getting a lot. I, and I just recently got a email from somebody who was like, yeah, I, I had, a." 
celiac disease. So I had cut gluten many years ago um, and I was cooking with healthy oils at home, but I wasn't really paying attention to what was in the processed foods I would buy, which weren't very many, by the way. Um, and I certainly wasn't paying attention to what I was ordering out. And I was doing that, you know, two, three, four times a week. And I developed atrial fibrillation. And then when I decided to, you know, I, I saw you on Bill Maher, actually this person saw me on Bill Maher, read the Fabron Fix and decided to totally cut out the seed oils. Um, that he was inspired to read it because he had developed atrial fibrillation and his doctor told him to go on all these drugs he didn't want to take. So he was looking for an alternative. It just so happened I was on a news show and um, he did what I said. And now, several years later, he no longer has atrial fibrillation, which is pretty unusual. You know, it's just like not an easy other alternative explanation. Um, and I actually grilled him on some stuff. I said, were you drinking a lot of alcohol? Did you make a lot of other changes? And that was really the only change he had made. Um, and he'd also had some skin changes and skin problems that were a bother at that time. And uh, those went away too. So that I, I bring that up just to give you some sense of like, here's a person who thought he was being pretty good. Um, he wasn't doing a lot of refined carbohydrates because he was gluten-free. Um, he was cooking with uh, avocado oil and coconut oil at home, but he just wasn't reading labels or um, eating at rest, uh, paying attention to what he was eating at restaurants. So does that last little bit matter? I think it does. Certainly, you know, if you haven't been paying attention, it certainly matters for a while to really make a difference. If you're struggling with your health in some way, certainly it does. Okay. So processed foods, eating out in general, specifically the fryer. Yeah. Um, like preserves, you know, if you like sun-dried tomatoes, uh, certain olives are even, uh, you know, going to be in the, those kinds of oils, canned fish, um, like the health, the supposedly healthy, ready to eat microwavable dinners, lean cuisine, stuff like that. Um, even Whole30, unfortunately, has um, has has high oleic sunflower oil, which if sunflower oil is one of my hateful eight, the high oleic version, I'm not, the jury's still out on that because testing really hasn't been done on, on it. And, you know, we know what it's composed of, but we don't really know how removing all of its antioxidants during the refining has a practical effect on its oxidizability. That hasn't been studied very much in very many different settings. And it just takes a lot of different research because the exact food that it's cooked in matters, right? So it may do well in one paper and do very poorly in another because it's cooked in, they're studying different foods. So for now, that's, you know, on my not don't eat list still, high oleic sunflower oil. You know, that may change as we get more information. But um, yeah, so these healthy, you know, just because it's paleo, it doesn't even mean that it doesn't have that, right? You have to read the ingredients. So really the, you know, the first habit to develop is the turn it around. When you're shopping, pick it up, turn it around, bring a magnifying glass. If you're over 40, my husband can't see anything. So, you know, get those reading glasses out with you and spend some time. It won't be every time you go shopping, but for a couple of weeks, it's going to take you a while to go shopping. And on my website, I have a lot of alternative products that you can buy online because there are crackers, there are chips, there are foods that you can get. There are some brands that are starting to ride this wave of, of consumer awareness that the seed oils are unhealthy for us. Well, let's talk more about the chip piece. I wanted to go there next. <laughs> You're seeing chips like plantain chips cooked in coconut oil and and different chips that are cooked in avocado oil, just because these are better oils, because of the way that they're processed, I'm assuming high heats, are they okay to eat on occasion? Yeah, on occasion. Yep. I'm not going to say they're good for you, but I actually have three categories of fat. I have, you know, bad, avoid these you know, if you can, you got to avoid them. Um, and then I have good. <laughs> oh, no, I have to do my middle finger. <laughs> no. um, in the middle, we have the okay, but not great. And those are the refined avocado oil, the refined coconut oil, uh, the lower grades of olive oil, the refined peanut oil, although refined peanut oil might be bad. Uh, it's 
it's, uh, you know, I'm the one that's like, I get to decide what I think. Right. And so sometimes, uh, you know, as I learn more, I kind of change my mind, but, um, but still the, the hateful eight, you know, the refined ones, that's rock solid. Um, the, and then the, the unref, the refined versions of the healthier foods like palm oil, that's also okay. It's on my okay list. You know, for a while it was off because something happened. Um, there was this huge uh, deal around Nutella in 2017 where they realized that there was a, a carcinogen in it called glycidyl. And the food scientists got on the job and they said, well, okay, we have to modify how we're processing it. They modified it. Now there's no glycidyl in Nutella anymore, at least not very much. So refined um, palm oil went from my bad list to my okay, but not great list. So like, that's another reason that sometimes these things have to be a- adapted and adjusted is because the food supply changes a little bit. Okay. Let's take a hypothetical example. Somebody who wants to change their diet around, they're going to get rid of the seed oils. They're likely not going to be eating out very often. We're allowed to have the slow digesting carbs. Let's talk about the rest of the diet as a whole. So that's, um, yeah, that's a really good question. What are we supposed to eat if these, these fats are toxic and, um, you know, can we really eat animal fat? That's kind of another big question and a big stumbling block for a lot of people because we've just, some of us have just grown up for so many years hearing that it's bad. And the answer is it's not bad. It was always just framed. It was framed as the cause of heart attacks by a man named Ansel Keys. And I talk about that. And uh, my next book coming out, how like all the details of how it was framed, it was really quite quite a story there. Um, but um, it, it, yeah, there's some of that story is already out, but um, there's more to it. That's that's got a lot of I think interesting intrigue. But um, yeah, so what was the question? <laughs> Sorry, I got well, just the in. diet as a whole. We've talked about a few pieces, yeah. but somebody that's trying to fill in the gaps now and figure out what their new diet might look like. Yeah, actual food, right? So just shop around the edge of the grocery store, right? Just don't get the processed stuff. So any kind of meat, uh, the better quality meat is going to be better. The more expensive stuff, you know, the pasture stuff, or at least the organic stuff, you know, the, the best quality animal foods that you can afford are worth the money. Um, and then vegetables and some fruits, not too many, um, and, and nuts and some seeds, not too much of that. And there are breads that you can eat, uh, sprouted grain bread I recommend because sprouts, sprouting the grains does a lot of good things. And so these breads that you can buy now in the frozen section are actually better for us than regular whole wheat, whole grain bread. Um, so I just recommend, like I show people, I teach people how to upgrade every little thing that you possibly can. Sandwich meat is another example. So you could, can you eat sandwich meat? Yes. But I do recommend avoiding the sandwich meat that has the nitrites in it. Um, and so it will say nitrites and nitrates. Nitrates, I think are more okay, um, than the nitrites. And so there's certain brands now, like Applegate is a common brand, um, that they don't use the nitrites. They just use the nitrates from celery salt. I think those are better. Um, so sandwich meat, uh, cheese, eggs, if I didn't say that already, butter, cottage cheese, any kind of dairy, dairy and eggs are like, you could live on that stuff. (laughs) Uh, ground beef, it's like so inexpensive and very nutritious, even if it's not grass fed and pasture raised, it's still awesome. Ground lamb, any kind of poultry, even if it's not, you know, the ideal pasture raised stuff. Um, the, 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 the food, the fat of this poultry is going to be a little more high in polyunsaturates than, you know, than other animals, but it, come on already. Let's not worry about, let's making our lives ridiculously difficult. If you want to, you can totally avoid that and only eat, you know, low poof of pork, which is great. Um, but it's, can get a little restrictive and ridiculous and insanely expensive. And then your whole life is wrapped around this. Um, people have had it fantastic results not paying attention to like avoiding poultry and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, they've had fantastic results, just taking kind of the low hanging fruit approach, you know, avoiding the vegetable oils, getting some healthier carbs, trying to eat plenty of actual vegetables and, you know, even enjoying some fruits from time to time. 
It's, it doesn't have to be that complicated. You can become perfectionist about it if you want to. And, you know, if you enjoy that sort of thing, more power to you because you're going to be supporting some of the best farmers out there and, um, you know, supporting that whole healthy food chain, which is fantastic. So I'm not saying don't do that, uh, but I'm just saying you'll still have amazing results, even if you can't. Okay. Well, where this gets complicated is for me and for the audience is talking to different experts. Everybody has their own thing that they're avoiding and things they're including. And it sounds like for you, one area I want to dig into is the plant toxins. You mentioned sprouted bread, which leads me to believe, and actually from your book, you talk about gluten. Gluten's okay, but a lot of people are saying no gluten. Right. So how do you feel about lectins like gluten, oxalates, plant toxins as part of this diet picture? Yeah. So uh, humans have bred plants to be edible for many thousands of years. So let's not get obsessed with that idea either. Um, you know, I think you can go down a lot of rabbit holes uh, with a lot of kind of um, partial information. Um, you know, it, it's just when you look at it closely, it just doesn't stand up. And so it, it kind of falls into the category. Uh, I hate to say this, but like knowing enough, enough to be dangerous, right? I've done nothing but this sort of thing for 24 years now. And um, I've come up with the, the what I think is a solid philosophy that other people have copied. And so I think that I'm, I'm bringing that up not to say don't, you know, they shouldn't have copied me. I'm saying, no, more people <laughs> should copy me because what I recommend works and people are copying it because it works, you know, not necessarily because they think I'm, you know, the one person you should pay attention to, but because the results speak for themselves. And, um, and I'm, you know, proud of the fact that when I wrote Deep Nutrition, uh, finally published it first in 2008 and then updated it immediately in 2009, I have had to change very little because I did an insane amount of work and research before writing that book, I started writing it in 2002. It was going to be a pamphlet for my patients just to talk about you know, the processed carbs and vegetable oils. But I found so many of these rabbit holes with these other experts' ideas that I had to come to grips with and decide, are they right? You know, should I recommend that or not? And so just about everything I've already dealt with in my first book, called Deep Nutrition, which was uh, republished in 2017, and which the Lakers based their dietary regimen on after uh, Gary Vitti, who's a legend in the NBA, read Deep Nutrition. And um, he said that he's read all the diet books because everybody wants him to weigh in or they want you know, his endorsement. Um, and he said, my book, Deep Nutrition, was the first that he actually, that actually convinced him to change the way he was eating because it makes sense, right? Again, I'm not saying I'm the smartest person in the universe, so therefore you should listen to me. I just want you to hear what I have to say, the whole story, because Deep Nutrition is a whole other story we haven't even touched on, ancestral health and epigenetics and the Fibonacci sequence and all the fascinating information that um, I discovered when I was writing that book. But so like, just listen to what I have to say. And if it doesn't make sense to you, then I failed. Right. And that's, that's, that's on me. <laughs> Let's get into the saturated fat piece a little bit more because a lot of people transitioning to this way of eating are naturally going to be getting rid of vegetable oils. Like we're recommending and including more animal products, so likely more saturated fat, which conventional thinking leads us to believe that we're going to put ourselves at risk for heart disease. Right. So let's put people at ease and get into some of the physiology there of why saturated fat and these animal fats are a health food. Well, it has to do with our chemistry. The saturated fats don't react spontaneously with oxygen, and so our cells can control the energy release when our mitochondria burn them for fuel. It's really as simple as that. It's about controlling them. And so like they're, they're healthy. Now to understand this, like how are they not causing heart attacks? That is a 
a made up idea that, that came out of somebody's head. <laughs> okay. So you have to understand the origin of that idea. We didn't always, people didn't always believe that saturated fat caused heart attacks. There was a time and a place where this idea was invented and that, and there was a person responsible for it. And so in my first book, I talk about that person, that person, his name was Ansel Keys and he was extremely egotistical. He suppressed some of, he, he lied about um, how much data he had. He uh, bullied people who disagreed with him. He was a uh, very good social engineer. So he engineered himself up all the way to the highest authority in the nutrition world, uh, being friends with the, the doctor, the personal physician of Eisenhower, the president of the United States. He became uh, one of the leaders in the American Heart Association, which to this day still maintains that saturated fat is the cause of the seed oils. And I'm sorry, is the cause of heart attacks and strokes. And what the American Heart Association will not tell you is that they got $1.7 million of money from Procter and Gamble in the year 1948. And Procter and Gamble sell vegetable oils. The Heart Association, the American Heart Association doesn't want you to know that. But that's the beginning of the story of why we believe saturated fat causes heart attacks. Because this guy named Ansel Keys wanted to get credit for discovering the cause of heart attacks. He was an egomaniac. He got money for research and he did research. So it's not like he had to be paid, you know, millions of dollars in payoffs. It wasn't like even designed on purpose. And uh, this is, I tell this story in a little more detail in my next book, but it just has to do with being an, um, being a politician about your career and kind of not being a scientist, right? Choosing between the easy route to fame or following the truth. And Ansel Keys followed the easy route to fame. And we are all sick because of it. And the American Heart Association today has not corrected the record. They still maintain Ansel Keys was a great scientist. And today, the American Heart Association, I think, is the most evil medical organization on the planet because they could fix this problem that we're all living on seed oils. They could fix it tomorrow if they wanted to because they created the myth that chased us away from real healthy food and conveniently for them, towards their benefactor, the processed food industry. So that is why we think saturated fat causes, you know, heart attacks. It doesn't. It was just made up. It was, it, it was like the nu nutrition science coming from the American Heart Association is not truly a science. You could, you could say this, and people have said this, I've said this, you know, when you look at nutrition science and how often they are influenced by industry, they really have become just a marketing arm of the processed food industry. And that's this, that's not a conspiracy theory. That is an up-to-date, you know, uh, status check on what's going on in our world today. So what do you think about all this? Because I, I know you've had other people on, a lot of them are experts, really smart people. They haven't talked about this like this. Well, I'm so just I, curious. I want to know what you think. Like, how, are you going to avoid the seed oils? Have you already been? Oh, I've been avoiding them. Yeah, best I can. I mean, I'm sure some <laughs> sneak in here and there. What I'm curious about, though, with that story you just told, do you feel like with people like you sharing this message that we're getting closer to a day where truth is going to be known on a conventional realm? Yes, absolutely. I don't think you can keep the truth, a truth like this that affects everybody um, every day. I don't think you can keep this quiet for, for very much longer, especially not um, since more people are, you know, are talking about it. For many years, it was really just myself and uh, you know, a tiny few other people like Mark Sisson, his original book talked about them uh, a little bit. You know, he was mostly talking about the hydrogenated fats. Um, and then, you know, people started talking about the ratio and at least that got 
got folks off of soy oil and corn oil, although it sort of helped promote canola oil for a while because canola oil has a lot more omega-3 than the others. But, um, but yeah, so, but now I'm seeing just more and more people writing similar books, you know, saying got to get off the seed oils and putting it together as like, uh, there's one book called the, un- the Unholy Trinity, and they specifically say seed oils and uh, sugar and refined flour, right? And then uh, there's other books that are, I know, coming out that uh, people are going to be talking about this more. Um, Callie and Casey Means, keep an eye on them because they have the story straight. If you haven't interviewed them, I'm sure you're going to want to soon. <laughs> uh, but, but they got it. They got it right. Um, you know, I... Uh, I, I might have helped uh, Casey Means come to realize that because I spoke with her about my book and sent her my book like five years ago. So um, I'm patting myself on the back for that because, uh, you know, I I, uh, I need to give myself credit because I've been working so hard uh, for 24 years on this and I still have the job's not done, right? So I still have to like say, well, at least we've I've gotten this done, you know, like where more influencers are like you are talking about, um, these seed oils or content creators or however you identify yourself. (laughs) What I'm curious, you mentioned 24 years. It sounds like nobody else at that time was talking about seed oils. Absolutely not. Was there anybody? When when my brother- And two is just to layer onto that, I'll have you expand, but what was it at that time that turned you onto this? Chemistry. So, um, uh, so I came across a book called Spontaneous Healing when I myself was really sick and nothing was making me better. Um, and in that book by Andrew Weil, he brought up the term essential fatty acids, which are the omega-3 and omega-6. And so I was like, oh, that's chemistry. I, I, I had just gone to medical school. I hadn't learned much about these things. I thought all fats were equally bad. You know, they're all high calorie, just bad for you. Got to avoid them, cause heart attacks. Um, so, you know, I was, I was you know, trained like every other doctor. And um, then I realized that these were polyunsaturated fatty acids and they were special because I had learned before I went to medical school, I actually went to biochemistry, study biochemistry at Cornell. And I had learned that polyunsaturated fatty acids react with oxygen just as part of my advanced organic chemistry course. And I knew there was something important going on there. I wasn't sure if they were going to help me or hurt me when I first started looking into it. But once I did, I, I, it didn't take long before I realized, oh my God, these things are terrible and I've been eating them. So this gave me a lever that I was looking for to change my diet. And I did get better. I got, you know, I got basically from being unable to walk to being able to hike and bike for hours. So I got massively better. Coming back to the saturated fat story, tethering that to LDL cholesterol, we've talked about how your diet you're recommending isn't no carb or low carb. It's just, we want the slower absorbing carbs, but it's still going to be, at least from my perspective, a lower carb diet. So somebody adopting that, there's a good chance their LDL will go up. And just so they know ahead of time and they're armed when their doctor might bring it to their attention that this seems dangerous, you're an advocate for LDL actually being a good thing. So talk about that. Yes. Well, that's the content of my next book. So you're going to have to have me on again. <laughs> oh, I already said I was. We're going to do it. We'll get into deeper into the Ansel Keys story too. Yeah. But, but for people that are going to make this dietary switch, it's good we're giving them the heads up about LDL going up. Mm-hmm. But let's talk about and give them that safety net for themselves and for their doctor. Why, in your opinion, this is a good thing. Well, cholesterol, you know, in the body has a function (laughs) and that function is to keep every cell in our bodies alive. And we actually have depleted our cholesterol by eating a lot of seed oils. So the reason seed oils are promoted as healthy, why, why, why are they promoted as healthy? Well, there was a reason back in the sixties and seventies, it was because they lower cholesterol How do they do that? Well, you know, that's chemistry. They, they oxidize it. Um, and, um, it lowers our cholesterol. And so when you get the seed oils out of your diet and the carbohydrates, yes, definitely those, those, um, LDL levels can, can go quite high. Uh, but that's just you restoring your body to health. The whole idea that cholesterol is bad. Again, we have to look at who's talking here. What's the source of this information? 
that comes from Ansel Keys and nobody else. So we can't trust him. So don't trust him. <laughs> Let's talk about intermittent fasting and snacking because those are tied together. So snacking and fasting are, uh, I'm sorry, actually it's not snacking and fasting are on a spectrum just of how many hours you're going without eating. And the first thing to master is not snacking. And how do you know when you've mastered it? When you can go between meals and you don't experience any of the hypoglycemia symptoms. Now you might experience hunger if you're used to snacking because your stomach has a circadian clock and it will get its digestive juices going, making you feel a little bit hungry at the time that you normally have your you know, snack. And so that kind of hunger where you don't have the hypoglycemia symptoms, perfectly safe to ignore. Just drink some water, get busy, chew some gum, do something, use that willpower muscle a little bit. We do have to use some willpower sometimes. <laughs> I try to minimize that because, you know, you only have so much. Um, but um, yeah, so the first thing to do is not, is master the not snacking. What happens between, what do you do if you do have hypoglycemia symptoms? Well, this is why it's so important to know the difference between normal hunger and hypoglycemia symptoms. What you should do is have maybe like a pretzel or a couple nuts, just a little bit of something to give you a little bit of some alternative fuel for your body to make it all the way to your next meal. But the other thing that it means is that you have to build that previous meal. Like let's say you, you get this hypoglycemia at four o'clock because you had lunch. Um, you had, you, you know, your, your lunch was at noon. Maybe you didn't have quite enough healthy fats in there, or maybe it was just a little too light, right? So you want to plan that a little bit differently next time so that it sustains you for longer. And this is why I say it's really not great to focus on weight first. You have to focus on getting yourself over that hump of not needing snacks first. Once you've mastered that, and now you don't have any hypoglycemia, you can experiment with cutting back on your meals. And this is kind of, I don't use this term in the book, but um, it's partial intermittent fasting, right? Like, let's say you just have a lighter lunch. Instead, you don't skip lunch, but you have less for lunch. Because now you've rehabilitated your mitochondria a little bit. They can burn body fat a little bit more um, for a little bit longer. Now maybe you don't need so many calories at lunch. And then you can start pulling back. And that's where you're going to start seeing some, some of the fat loss that you want once you start burning your body fat. I guess the biggest concept we haven't even mentioned is that you can't lose weight if you can't burn your body fat. I mean, you can lose muscle. You don't want to do that. You can't lose weight in a healthy way if you can't burn your body fat. And you have to be able to burn your body fat. And your mitochondria have to be healthy enough for that to happen. Otherwise, you're just trapping yourself in a vicious cycle of yo-yo weight cycling, which is not healthy. Um, so that's why I teach people, you know, I'm sorry. I know you want to get in the bikini by a certain amount of time. You probably will use, lose some weight if you stop snacking and build healthier meals. But please don't focus on the number on the scale. Please focus on your hypoglycemia going away that and how you feel, because that's a reflection of how healthy your mitochondria are. Please focus on those little mitochondria. Well, let's go over something you just said and make sure we really hash that out because it is so important. Somebody that is struggling to lose weight and their fat is locked up in the fat cells. I brought up earlier the fact that insulin needs to be low to use that. We've been talking about mitochondrial health with the seed oils, but let's package that in a nice way for people. How do we make sure and know, other than obviously if you're losing weight over time, that we're accessing the fat on our body as fuel for the mitochondria? If we can get to that point where we are eating fewer calories than we used to and we don't have those hypoglycemia symptoms. And there's other little apps and things that you can use. Like there's something called a lumen, which you blow into and it sort of measures somewhat accurately whether you're burning fat or carbohydrates, but it doesn't distinguish between body fat and dietary fat. So it doesn't really get you what you need, um, but it still you know, gives you some insights, at least to that fat question. And then the other um, cool thing that you can get is a keto breath meter, um, because that will at least tell you if you're producing ketones, which generally come from body fat, but unfortunately they can also come from alcohol or uh, muscle, you know, a protein. They can come from protein. So it's not 100% either. 
Um, but still it gives you some idea if you are looking for just a little bit of like, how, how am I doing? But mostly it's really a matter of mastering. How do you feel? How is your energy level? And are you enjoying what you're doing? And so this is where just like the joy of eating and the joy of cooking, I think it's important, right? Because forgetting about like, we're talking about long time scales here. I'm not promising you, you're going to be able to you know, maybe you could lose five pounds by Memorial Day, but you're not necessarily going to lose 50, which is what a lot of people want. And um, I'm not promising that because because I, I want to be able to deliver on my promises. So in the meantime, enjoy the journey, right? Get some get food that you like. It, you know, if you like Indian, uh, but your favorite uh, Indian restaurant doesn't, you know, they use seal oils. Well, maybe just learn a little bit about curry and start experimenting with that. You know, I, I was a terrible cook. I actually became a vegetarian for a few years. I had to think, was it vegetarian or was I vegan? I was vegetarian because uh, I, I can't go do without cheese um, because I didn't want to deal with meat. Like it was cold and slimy. I didn't know what was what, like flank steak and this mind boggling. What is this stuff? I knew ground beef, but <laughs> that's all I could make was burgers. So I became a vegetarian. So I can relate to not having any cooking skills. And over time, I, you know, I've just slowly learned a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And that has been very empowering and I've enjoyed it. And I like the food that I cook. It tastes good. And that's all available to you along this journey. And I, I really think it's important to focus on the joy of food and making good food for yourself and liking the way it tastes. And so what the first time it doesn't come out right, you learn, right? Maybe you too much heat. Maybe you didn't cook it enough. Maybe it was too much salt. But you learn and you are learning. And this is a life skill. And it, right now in this country, people are living without this life skill. <laughs> okay. It's a life skill. You try and live without a life skill, your life's going to be weird. And you know, now that we were getting sick from that. Let's talk more about the ketone piece. I know from your book, you're a fan of those. Is the ketogenic diet something we could use as a tool intermittently? Is this diet we're talking about keto in general? How do you look at keto? Well, I look at keto as, um, as a diet that doesn't quite deliver on all of its promises, okay? Because here's what's the deal. A lot of people can be producing ketones and still not be burning their body fat. So producing ketones isn't as important as burning your body fat. That's why I call the book the fat burn fix, not the keto fix. So, you know, but don't get me wrong. Like a keto diet can also be extremely healthy. But let's understand why. It's not because ketone producing ketones puts you in this magical state. It doesn't. You can produce ketones when you're when you have a flu. If you want a diet that produces the most ketones, start drinking whiskey or vodka, some kind of hard, hard alcohol with no sugar, because alcohol is the fastest route to blood ketones. In fact, ketone meters are measuring are also alcohol meters. Did you know that? No, but it makes sense. It's the same technology. Yeah. Same technology, same thing. So when, in fact, that's like a reason for a false positive when you're pulled over to get an alcohol breath test is being on a keto diet. So, um, so producing ketones is not the be all end all that a lot of people promise. It's just not. And this is why a lot of people go on the keto diet and start producing ketones, but just they don't, maybe they don't feel great because they need some carbs and they give up. The good thing about the keto diet is that it, uh, it directs you towards high cholesterol foods. And since we've been on this cholesterol depleting seed oil diet for many decades, most people, we need cholesterol and we need it fast. And so if you eat, you know, the, the eggs and the cheese and the animal fats, um, stuff like that, you are going to be replenishing your body supply of cholesterol. So, so it, that keto diet does that. The keto diet also gets people off of the empty calorie, you know, French fries, which also have a lot of seed oils and 
the, the empty calorie chips and crackers and donuts and, you know, excessive amounts of fruit that are relatively less nutritious than vegetables and meats. So the keto diet is going to direct people towards some really healthy foods. So I'm all for it. In fact, probably yesterday I, I ate a keto diet, you know, because I, I think I only had like one tiny little slice of bread or something and the rest was all like meat, vegetables, broth, you know, stuff like that. But you want to know why it's beneficial. And it's really about the nutrition it contains, not about putting your body in this magical state of ketosis, which turns out isn't all that magical. Just get the flu. You'll be producing ketones if you're not eating. Would you say it could be magical in a transition phase when somebody is a sugar burner and if they hacked ketosis through like an MCT oil or exogenous ketones, bringing in that other form of energy? It can do, it won't do much that um, just building a healthy meal will do, but um, actually on the topic of what to do if you have an energy lull, you know, if you do get hypoglycemic and you're seeking that snack, something that is a medium chain fatty acid would be a good solution because it you can burn that quickly and easily. So that would be a good solution in that scenario. But I wouldn't recommend it for anything else. MCT oil is basically empty calories. I hope you don't sell that or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, it's highly processed. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, it's extremely processed and there's nothing nutritious in there. It's just calories and medium chain triglycerides, which are short chain fatty acids, which we have no real biological need for. But if we are very metabolically unhealthy, sometimes we can burn those more easily than other fats. So when we're in this crisis between meals, I think it would be a good solution. But I would only recommend it for that scenario, honestly. All right, going further down the keto continuum to carnivore diet, how do you feel about that as a tool periodically or somebody that embraces that more long-term? I love it because of its simplicity, right? So when somebody's getting started and they don't want to pay attention to calories or reading labels or anything like that, if they just eat meats that they cook in an oil that they know is healthy, that's simple, right? But you can also throw in some eggs, you can throw in some vegetables, right? Like I, I see it as... Um, as a, as a great, also elimination diet. Like if you have an autoimmune disorder, maybe you do need to eliminate a whole bunch of stuff and then slowly add things back. But I, I don't love it long-term because the way that we do it is not as, not like a real carnivore. I mean, we're not, you know, having the most people who do it don't eat liver. They don't eat thymus. They don't know what to do with kidneys. They won't eat lungs. I mean, that's what a real carnivore used to eat every last bit, every last scrap of the animals that, that the hunters, right? The human hunters, we would eat everything. So, you know, now we just eat like the, the flesh and the nutritional profile of the flesh is not the same as all the organs. We really, if we want to be a true like hunter gatherer, on the hunter side of things, we have to eat the whole thing, all those organs, or it's not sustainable in the long term. And I, I have to tell people this, you know, warning story. I had a patient or not a patient. He read my book and, you know, the, the whole carnivore thing came out at the same time. And, um, and I said, yeah, the carnivore diet can be a good diet to like bridge the, bridge the gap. You know, he emailed me. Um, and you know, I would get updates from him every couple of years saying, oh, you know, I've lost 180 pounds over two years, which was great. But in the back of my mind, I was like, um, I was a little worried. And then after another, I'd say four years on mostly carnivore, he ends up with stage four kidney failure. And how can that happen? Well, all the nitrogen and the protein is just very reactive and it will react and it can damage kidneys. So, and I've heard kidney um, problems from many people. A gout is actually a kidney problem. Um, and uh, what's another related thing? Oh, kidney stones. Um, yeah. And hypertension. So it's just, I, I just, also, the original hunter-gatherers, they didn't cook their meat to death, and they certainly didn't reheat leftovers. And when you do that, you're changing the chemical nature, and it's just nowhere near as nutritious. It's harder on our kidneys because it creates toxins that the kidney and the liver has to eliminate. So it, it can be good in the short term. If you want to do it in the long term, you have to 
think like a caveman. <laughs> Coming back to the organ piece, tying this together, are you somebody that consumes organ meats on a regular basis for the nutritional value? Or how do you feel about that? Oh, yeah. I, I've um, found a way to cook liver that I actually really like. And now I have to not, <laughs> remember not to cook it too often. Um, but yes, uh, liver, uh, bone marrow is another thing I do. Uh, also, I can get my hands on, um, this is going to be gross. So guys, you might want to plug your ears. Um, you might want to plug your ears. <laughs> you know what I'm getting at here? You know what Rocky Mountain oysters are? I think so. <laughs> yeah. Testies? Goals, does the goals. Yes. I actually tried that because uh, I thought they might be a great source of vitamin E because they turn yellow when you cook them and that would be something vitamin E would make that happen. And um, I never knew why they call them oysters, but they have the same texture. They're, they're very soft and interesting. And they actually don't taste bad. They're, they're sort of like veal. It's weird. Tell us <laughs> the uh, liver recipe. Super simple. Just get uh, chicken liver and dredge it in a ton of flour, like pack that flour in there and then put a ton of butter in your pan and sizzle it up. Wow. It's like chicken nuggets, except a little tiny bit livery, but not in a disgusting way, like the way liver usually is. <laughs> and put lots of salt and pepper, black pepper. And for people that are just getting, getting into organs, I'm in this camp too. The supplements now in the market, you talk about in your book, the desiccated organ supplements. I find those are just really easy for people. And again, yeah. myself. Okay. Yeah, they, they are easy for people. And and I, I recommend them if you literally can't do anything else. Um, but, you know, they are dehydrated, so you're going to lose some nutrition there. And, um, and they're also expensive. So, um, you know, because it's basically it's just liver that has been dehydrated. And so it's one fourth, like by weight, just multiply it by four times. So if you're having, you know, swallowing six gram capsule, that's 24 grams of liver, which is like an ounce and a half. Um, you know, so when you do the math on like whatever they cost, like 50 bucks for, for, does it last a month, that bottle? I guess it depends how many you take yeah, and exactly. the brand I mean, and such. So it, it won't even last a month. So like it, it's, it's not money well spent in my opinion, but if you can do nothing else, then that will work. Okay. Probably. So when it comes to <laughs> organs, it sounds like you're on the fence coming back to before you mentioned no, fish oils. Wait a second. I know I'm only on the fence about like the supplement form of organ, but no, that's what organs. I meant. That's what I meant. Yeah, Cause I'm, okay. I'm segueing okay. into supplements as a whole here. And when it comes to fish oil, that's a no go. But again, branching into supplements as a whole for somebody that is eating this nutrient dense, healthy diet, like we're talking about today, any supplements you recommend to round that out? Yeah. So, um, so in the fat and fix, one of my big major steps is called smart supplementation because, um, we do need vitamins and minerals. Um, most of us, uh, unless we are, you know, tracking all of our vitamins and minerals and eating you know, a lot of organ meats and extraordinarily healthy nutrient intense foods from really healthy soil, our, our foods are just lower in these essential nutrients than they should be. So we do need to supplement with some basics. Um, and I talk about what those are in the, in the book I, on my website. Also, you might want to put a link to my supplements page, but, um, then there's stupid supplementation, which I don't call it that, but I, I mean, it, that's what really, it really, what, there's so many supplements out there that are just taking advantage of, of people's want, desire to be healthy or like this whole biohacking movement. Um, it, it's made up of people who, you know, they mean well, they're not out there to rip you off, but they, most of them in the space, they, they know enough to be dangerous and, and that's what's happening. And I, I, I hate to make a sweeping blanket statement like that, but I can't not and be honest with, you know, that's my medical opinion, right? Take it or leave it. <laughs> okay. Well, give us a little bit of nuance there. In both categories, what do we want to make sure we're taking? We'll link up your page, but what do people want to make sure they at least consider? And then what are a couple of the quote unquote frauds out there that you've seen? So you want to consider a balanced multivitamin and you probably need some minerals. Um, and what you need depends on what you eat and what you don't eat. And that's that's uh, like, for example, if you don't eat dairy, then you might need to supplement with calcium, right? If you don't eat red meat, you might not be getting enough iron, depends, but, um, you know, can't hurt to supplement with a little iron. So 
Um, so those are the the good things that I recommend. But an example of like just ridiculous is resveratrol. I mean, that was like such a craze. It was on 60 Minutes and that is complete nonsense. It, it's the whole idea was that it has the antioxidants of, of red wine. And that was back when we believed that red wine had actual benefits. We've done more analysis of those original studies. And it turns out that rich people who eat well um, and don't eat a lot of junk food, drink more red wine. And that's why red wine looked healthier on, on you know, these surveys that people did. It wasn't, had nothing to do with the wine itself. It had to do with the rest of their diet and what they were not eating because they were drinking wine. If you drink wine after dinner, you're not having piles of cookies either. So, I mean, it's just like basic common sense that was not being applied to the, the field of nutrition science because why do that when you can make tons of money selling resveratrol? I mean, that was like entire companies were founded on that and sold for millions and millions of dollars. So it's, it's a scam, right? I mean, I think most supplements are as bad or worse than the pharmaceutical industry, to be honest, because they're plying on people who at least want to do something natural or at least, you know, looking outside the box, uh, trying to think for, um, trying to think in a healthy way, you know, not just trusting their doctor, trying to do their own independent research. And, and these people are taking advantage of it and, and they give you enough science to sound like there's something there, but I call it Marvel comic science, right? Like, you know, like, um, Spider-Man became, gained spider strength because he was bit by a spy, a radioactive spider. Well, gosh, that makes perfect sense if you are a comic strip <laughs> writer. Um, but you know, the sad reality is that most of these supplements are, are worthless. Another one I see a lot is milk thistle. I took that myself. I bought into the whole thing. I needed milk thistle to, to get over what was bothering me. Um, and it, of course it did nothing, but then I looked into it and it's like, first of all, it's probably not even anything. And secondly, it's like this, um, liver support. What is that? Our liver doesn't need support from some plant that only grows on a certain climate in some corner of the world that not everybody can access. If nature designed our liver to need this one plant milk thistle, we would have only lived where that plant grows, <laughs> Right. It just doesn't make sense on a common sense level. And, and liver support is a meaningless term, by the way. You can't really, you know, what is liver support? What is it? Do you know? Not specifically. I mean, exactly. same realm as what you'd assume. <laughs> so I can assume when it comes to products like NAC and glutathione, things to detox, because we, I'm sure, would both agree our modern world is radically different than the world we evolved in. Oh yeah. So sometimes we need to do radical things to combat that. So do you see any any purpose for certain supplements or certain foods to detox the body or are you a fan of just stay out of the way and it it'll do its thing? I think we should trust our liver and our kidney. I mean, that's what they do. They do detox for us. And all we need to do to really support them is just give them a healthy diet. That's what liver support is to me. Um, a healthy diet and try to minimize the toxins, right? If you can afford to get organic stuff, uh, do. If you're smoking, you want to cut down. If you drink a lot of alcohol, drink less. Um, you know, if you eat a lot out of a lot of plastic, that's a whole other category of toxin that we're just starting to understand people are bombarding their bodies with. I think that is where you're going to get a lot more bang for your buck, honestly, than by chasing down the latest supplement. I mean, since I've been in this for 24 years, I have literally seen hundreds of supplements come and go. I've had patients who were on so many supplements, they had to keep a spreadsheet to keep track of them, and they weren't particularly healthy. And I helped them get off most of them. I've had people taking supplements that landed them in the hospital several times that I told them to stop and they felt a lot better. So, you know, I mean, it's not like supplements are, I'm not, I am against supplements. I'm going to just say that like most supplements are stupid except for vitamins and minerals. Um, and it, it's not for nothing. It's not just because they're a waste of money. People are taking advantage of your sucking money out of your wallet. It might be beneficial. There might be some magic to them. No, I've seen people be harmed from these things. Uh, for a while, there was a supplement that came from, uh, Oh, uh, or orange plant uh, that uh, was similar to turmeric. I can't remember what, what it was, but there was a drink 
wildly popular drink made out of this stuff. Well, this was a, a it was a fat burner, right? A fat burning supplement. You're going to hack your mitochondria and make your mitochondria burn fat. Guess what it really did? It uncoupled your mitochondria and it caused atrial fibrillation because you can't do that to your heart, you know, if especially not if you're not young <laughs> and, you know, metabol a little bit metabolically on the edge. So uh, that was one of the supplements that landed people in the hospital. Where is that supplement now? It's off the market. It was removed. And, you know, thank goodness they discovered that right? Thank goodness it was specific enough. But some of these other supplements, um, you know, might be doing harm and we just don't know because there's so many now it's hard to tease it all out. Now, some of the supplements that are nutrients like, um, uh, uh, carnitine and, um, uh, not cysteine, I'm blanking right now, sorry, but so the supplements that are also nutrients like glutathione, right? Some people supplement with that. Um, that's not going to, I don't think that's going to be harmful, but it, it, it's more one of those things that, um, you know, if it's something your body, you know, makes, your body can probably make it on a healthy diet, but on the other side, it's probably not harmful, right? But if it's something that is like your anything along the lines of, of hacking or, you know, like, uh, some chemical that came from some tree or plant or root or whatever, that's some chemical that your body does not have a physical need for, stay away. Chromium is another example. Our body has no physical need for this, but yet it's sold as a, as a sugar stabilizer. Absolute crap. Okay. It could, be, it could be bad for you. We don't need it. Anything that we don't need, we probably ought to stay away from. One thing that has controversy around it that you do believe we need is salt. Let's end on this because a lot of people are fearing salt. They're not using it, or if they are, they're being very sparing with it. You're a fan of, of using a moderate to high amount on our food. Talk about that. Absolutely. So more people end up in the hospital every year with low sodium in their blood than with high sodium in their blood. In fact, it's impossible to have high sodium in your blood unless you are seriously dehydrated, have kidney failure, heart failure, or are taking certain medications. Why? Because if you eat too much salt, your body's not stupid. Your body is going to either make you thirsty or make you pee it out. So your kidneys handle it. And in fact, it's very difficult to eat food that is too salty because it's disgusting. We don't even want to swallow it. We'll spit it out. That's one of the greatest ways to ruin a dinner is to add too much salt to it. So, you know, the, the, the body protects us against it. And the other thing that salt does that's good is that it makes food delicious. Um, it makes food taste better. When you go out to eat, if you wonder why you try to make a dish that you had at a restaurant and it seems like the exact same thing, but the recipe says season to taste instead of saying use a boatload of salt, <laughs> That's why it's not as good because salt tastes good. Salt triggers our taste buds in a way that helps them detect nutrients more and activates them more. It, it activates them synergistically so that if you have salt binding to your the same taste bud at the same time as you have like some amino acid in there, the savory part of it, um, or bitter or sweet or any of the other things, um, you're going to get, it's not a one plus one equal, equals two, it's a one plus one equals 10 kind of sensation in terms of the intensity and enjoyment of the taste there. So, um, so add some salt until it's too much. <laughs> and then you ate, and then it was too much. <laughs> Don't do it again. All right, Dr. K, we're going to end it there. As we discussed, we're going to do this again when the new book comes out. I'm excited to dig in and go even deeper into seed oils. So congrats on the upcoming book. And Thank you. for now, we're going to link up your website, your social media, your books in the show notes. And thank you. Thank you very much. This was a, a very in-depth conversation, but I think you do your listeners a great service. I can see why you're so popular because you really keep it oriented on what people need to hear. And um, thank you for, for asking so many good questions. Now that you're done with Dr. Kate, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Dr. Ali. He's another medical doctor who believes LDL cholesterol is a good thing. Don't miss this. I'll see you over there. And people are getting more comfortable in saying that a high LDL cholesterol in the setting of metabolic health.